so you just pick up a journal i most likely won't understand most of it and then suddenly i understand something which was this model that calcium signaling was starting then and then i could see ah uh, ah uh, now here it is welcome everyone to another interview of the series of interviews conducted by the department of chemistry the university of colombo I am Prandima De Silva, a fourth year chemistry special undergraduate at the University of Colombo. Today, I have the honor of interviewing Professor A. P. De Silva of Queen's University, Belfast. Before we get started, I would like to give you a brief account on Professor A. P. De Silva. Amira Prasanna, also known as A. P. De Silva, was born in Colombo and obtained his PhD in organic photochemistry from Queen's University of Belfast. having graduated from our very own the University of Colombo Sri Lanka his fascinating research into small logical molecules has found commercial application in diagnostics and sensors it has recently led to a breakthrough in labeling compound libraries he was also consultant for the chemistry module of the market leading opti point of care blood gas electrolyte analyzer currently sold by opti medical incorporated He was elected to the Royal Irish Academy in 2002. He also received the Royal Society of Chemistry Sciences Award in 2008 and the first international award for molecular sensors and molecular logic gates in the year of 2012. His book Molecular Logic Based Computation written in 2013 has also been available in Chinese and in Japanese since 2014. He also named as the latest recipient of the Boyle Higgins Gold Medal awarded by the Institute of Chemistry in Ireland. Congratulations to you on that as well. First of all, I would like to pay my gratitude to you, Professor, for giving us this wonderful opportunity to have this session with you. Professor, could you give a brief account of you, particularly about your childhood and early education? Yes, I can, Randima. You were very kind to. even find out very recent things thank you thank you for taking the time to research into these points uh, i am also very happy that both of us and neranga all members of the university of colombo at various times because i had a very happy time there uh, to answer your question yes i was uh, born in pamankada in vellavath which is not far from where the university of colombo is and in fact i used to walk to the university because it's close enough uh, and i was very fortunate that my uh, grandfather my father's father was a school teacher in pamankada so uh, i think i learned the value of an education and i could also see how valuable it was in building society and so i think that was an inspiration for a long period of time and my mother also had a great interest in general education and i'm very grateful that she kept teaching me english and i think it's helped me now to conduct international work in general uh, other than that i think i'm just very happy that i was in pavakade uh, later on my parents moved to mount lavinia but uh, in my heart i think still i'm a pavakade person and i was also fortunate that uh, i was brought up in a family of mixed religion which i am very grateful for so that i would have spent time in churches and a bit of time in covils and of course in a pirivena where i was very privileged to study for uh, quite a long period of time and because of that i also learned about public speaking and debating and general matters that we need in science as well so i have been very grateful for that mixed cultural background that i have had Okay, sir. Uh, what do you consider one of your greatest achievements in chemistry, and why do you think so? Uh, if I mention chemistry research and teaching that I have been privileged to do, I think the greatest achievement has been to help people to reach their potential. Lots of different people, like as a teacher, as you know, like. whenever we teach we demonstrate or lecture then there are younger people who come into our hands and then they have to reach their potential in a little while and then as teachers 
And I saw this with my CEO. So how they can help people to reach their potential. So uh, that's been a pleasure I've had all along, whether it's uh, teaching classes for undergraduate lectures or for people with whom I've been able to do research in the University of Colombo, as well as in Belfast here. And in all those cases, I've had the chance to see how individual people could reach their potential. And of course, one of those people who reached their potential, at least to some extent, was also me. Because when I'm conducting research or when I'm teaching, I am learning all over again. And so that has helped me also. And further, when we do research especially, then we are discovering new knowledge. And when we are discovering new knowledge, that can be used to a lot of people who we will never meet and that will help them to reach their potential also and then as you kindly mentioned Randima like I was very fortunate to be involved in commercial products of science and then those are very direct cases of people reaching their potential because if not for those products some of those people would be dead and so being able to contribute to increasing somebody's life and increasing their quality of life is also a way of helping people to reach their potential, I think. Yes. What inspired you to pursue chemistry and how did you end up in the field of molecular logic that you have pioneered? Uh, that's two, two difficult questions there. But yes, I again, I think I would take it back to my CEO. I, I, I wasn't fortunate enough to see both my grandfathers, I only saw one, but uh, he was larger than life for me. And I think I learned a lot of his skills and I admired his skills. And so I think that's helping me even to this day. So I think he inspired me very much in terms of learning, learning and then making it a career when he was a teacher and I'm a teacher. And, and then he also investigated, like he, he investigated astrology, which scientists may not uh, have a great deal of connection with, but uh, I, I found it very fascinating as a child because they, they study according to a particular pattern and scientists, we do the same. And so I was very grateful for that. And uh, I was very grateful also in particular, I think my mother helped me to get hold of books on science and technology and later my father helped me too. But initially it was my mother's help very directly. It was an encyclopedia of science and technology. Uh, we were a very poor family, but she got her like a second-hand flood-damaged book. But it remained a very valued possession with me for a very long time. And so then I was able to see in that book examples of discoveries and inventions which enabled society to, to improve. And, and then I was lucky Then later I was able to contribute a little bit myself. So I think those were some of the people who pointed me towards chemistry, but not directly. My CEO may be more for knowledge and learning in general, and my mother into more like science and English in general. But the person who directly aimed me to chemistry was a teacher I had in high school, but then he left my school and then he was one of Sri Lanka's first tuition teachers. And before it became an industry. And so I was very fortunate to learn with him. And again, it was very close to the University of Colombo in Temple Lane in Bambalapitiya. And so that teacher was Errol Fernando. He passed away about a year ago now, but uh, he was a continuing inspiration. I would have seen him every year when I would visit Sri Lanka at Christmas time. So those were the forces and the persons who oriented me towards chemistry. But uh, the logic part happened much slower. But, but Randima, you've certainly done the research on the little things I've been able to do. And now there again, the University of Colombo helped greatly. I think the University of Colombo, because it, as you know, it's uh, based in a small land area. And so because of that, and especially when we study, they're like you and me. And then, then we get to know each other from undergraduate time. And then after that, when I was lucky to teach there for some time, again, then the other teachers are friends. And so as friends, then we discuss many topics. And then 
one of them called Satish Namasivaya. He did physics. Uh, he was two years older than me. And then he used to teach me about logic gates. Uh, we studied some logic gates in physics uh, at, again at the University of Colombo. But uh, Satish was the one who gave me a personal insight. He would take me to the lab and help me to fix things. And so then I learned a little bit more about logic gates from the semiconductor viewpoint and the way we use it in computers and phones now. And so Satish was a great help for me to get introduced to that topic. And also I must say, uh, maybe Randima, you know this person as well. It's Gihan Vikramanayak, uh, but he passed away, I think about two years ago, I think, sadly. Uh, he was in computer science. And so he taught me programming very early on. They had classes on Saturdays and I asked the computer science people, can I please come? And they said, that's okay. And another person was Kevin Seneviratna, who has now gone away. And he and I were in school together. So he taught me some as well. So those were some of the people who gave me insights into computer science and logic, even though uh, I am mainly chemistry and physics and maths person. But those ideas were very valuable for later. They stayed in my head and then later with another good friend from University of Colombo called Nimal Gunaratna. He's here in Queens, Belfast now. And then another friend of ours called Colin McCoy. Then we were able to slowly start to do molecular logic. Okay, sir. In what subdisciplines of chemistry are you working on right now? Uh, I am, that's a very difficult question for me, actually. Uh, I am quite confused in some ways about what sub-disciplines I should belong to. Uh, maybe because I'm very old, I, I like to learn chemistry as best as I can without restriction. Uh, but of course, uh, the subjects are very big and so uh, we have to make some limitations somewhere. Uh, but I have always valued generalism in chemistry actually in science. I think that goes back to my CR's time. I, I think it is that when you are learning, you learn everything. Of course, nowadays, there's maybe too much to learn in that way. But at least to maintain an interest in as many parts of knowledge as possible. And in fact, like that example I gave you, um, and which you gave me, the molecular logic part, that happened to me only because I was interested in physics and computer science, even though I'm supposed to be a chemist. So I was able to then bring ideas from those places into chemistry and also then to take the chemistry ideas to some of those people in those fields who were willing to listen. So to try to answer your question, I, like uh, to make molecules that I need to examine ideas or philosophies, then I have to learn some organic chemistry because organic chemistry seems uh, very well equipped to make what you want. Inorganic chemistry also will go in some, some way to doing that, but uh, carbon compounds are very versatile to make any shape and any size any three-dimensional structure and so on. So we need organic chemistry for that. Even if you want to make a polymer, then you have to know organic chemistry. But I liked inorganic chemistry and coordination chemistry very much while studying at the University of Colombo. Again, we had a teacher called Professor Ramakrishna, who was the head of department for uh, many years as well. And so he taught coordination chemistry, which I liked very much because that gave you a way of connecting metals with organic materials. And so I try to do some of that now. Um, so those two parts are both needed then for me to, first of all, to make things that I like to make. And then by putting metals, then you can bring new personalities into molecules. If you only do it with organic chemistry, then you're carbon, carbon, carbon. So it's really nice to be able to put in a metal. But then to understand those ideas, we need physical chemistry and analytical chemistry. Again, you may know uh, Professor H.D. Gunavardhana, 
Now, HD was one of the early people who used to say, along with other analytical chemistry professors, that chemistry is a branch of analytical chemistry. I think he had a point there uh, because to do analytical chemistry, they analytical chemists, real analytical chemists, they learn many parts of chemistry, and I like that. Uh, I'm not an analytical chemistry person as such, but I like to analyze, analyze. And I think that again goes back to people like my CEO or some of the Hamduros I met, they are, and some priests I met, and they, are, they analyze information that they have in different ways. So in chemistry, we need to do synthesis, which is to build up from small things, and analyze, which is to take something big and break it down as well. And of course, many of the ideas in chemistry come from physical chemistry. So, so I like to try to do little bits of all four. Okay, sir. So, uh, tell us about your research interest in using small molecule for logical functions and how you see your research program developing over the next few years. Uh, of course, I'm an old guy now, so I don't know how many more years I will have. But at the same time, I've had the pleasure for a long, long time now to try and connect uh, chemistry with things that are important to all of us as human beings. And if I can sort of illustrate that, like Randima, you and me and Neranga, like all of us are made of molecules and all the molecules inside of us somehow exchange information with each other, like we learn about DNA, but even things like within a cell, again, as you know, like calcium will, calcium ions, just atoms, will carry signals from the surface of the cell to the inner parts of the cell. So I think it is appreciated more and more now, but again, I'm very happy to say, in the late 19 or early 1980s, when I was in the University of Colombo, was the time when I started to read the little biology. I don't understand biology very well at all, but started to read a bit in the science library, which you have gone to and I have been in. And so then it was beginning in biology, this idea that atoms and molecules are the ones who really do the fundamental activities in biology, even though biology is believes in the cell model and organs and organisms. But below them are the molecules and molecules and atoms can perform very valuable functions. So in the 1980s was when uh, calcium ions were regarded as messengers inside cells. And so that's an atom which you and I know very well in chemistry. And so because of that, it was a real pleasure then to realize that even the biologists have to now start to understand and measure calcium concentrations in different situations. And so because of that, I think I realized at that time that uh, measuring things is a way of gathering information. So that was, I think, a real benefit from being in the Pirivena and places. Because that was thinking philosophically, not thinking just as a chemist. So biology has atoms and molecules inside handling information. Now this is well appreciated. Now this is well understood. But we were very happy at the time to realize this. And I think that was because of the, the religious education I had rather than the scientific education. So that looking philosophically, it seemed that atoms and molecules, which are very small, can still handle information to make bigger people, like, like we are much bigger than the atoms and molecules, and still those atoms and molecules then will control us. And so then there was that growing understanding, and then thanks to people like Satish, as I mentioned, then to realize, but that happened much later, I must confess, Randiva, not directly. First of all, I wanted to do like the analytical chemistry part, which is, can I measure the concentrations of atoms and molecules? Okay, I, ideally to do it inside humans, but I, I, since I don't know biology and medicine hardly at all, I could only develop methods for that. 
And so my earlier research, again, it started in the University of Colombo uh, with people like Cicero Di Silva and Ramya Lal, who you will know, they helped me lots in the labs and Mr. Amar Singh was there. And so they helped me greatly, greatly. And so what happened at that time was we started building molecular sensors. So molecular sensors are like indicators, which we all study in analytical chemistry again. So molecular sensors are also a way of measuring concentrations of various atoms and molecules in various places and at various times. And so I was lucky to be able to start thinking about that and, and to make some contributions from Colombo, uh, which then, or we were not the first, but there were others starting as well. But then we were very fortunate to develop a method to do that. So it's called this photo-induced electron transfer sensors. So those that was a method by which we could make fluorescent molecules, molecules which give out light, where the light signal tells you how many atoms or molecules are present. Just like an indicator will tell you from the color change what the pH is. And then that will be the proton concentration. So in the same way, we were able to then start to make cases of molecules, uh, measuring sodium or potassium or calcium. So, as I mentioned, we were not the first, but this method fluorescent PET sensors, we were like, we made it general for the first time. And so now it's used very widely around the world and it's used by biologists to do things as varied as measuring nerve signals. So literally they watch how living systems think now by using a method that started that your university Radhi, there. Yes. So it's from that that we went across to logic because uh, logic is more complicated, but it's related. So sensing is uh, getting the information from some place, atomic or molecular information from some place. So molecular sensors can do that. And there are many examples now some from us, but from many other labs around the world. But now logic is where you take some information coming from atoms and molecules, and then you ask for some molecule to change that information. So like we can change information all the time. Like you are like, for example, you asked me a question. And then I give you an answer. So I am not repeating exactly what you say. I take what you give me and then I process that question. And then I try to give you an answer if the question is not too difficult. So in, that is the way by which processing happens all the time. But then what we realized was, and that we were the first to realize, and it was wonderful, and to make experimental examples. Other people had realized it before. People had thought about how molecules will handle information, but there were no experimental examples. And so we were very fortunate to be able to do that. And again, to that, we had a big contribution from where I am now in Belfast, because um, Belfast is in Northern Ireland. But uh, as you can guess, then there is a Southern Ireland. And Southern Ireland is where logic for the phone or the computer started. Again, it is not very appreciated because Ireland is maybe not the biggest country in the world, but uh, logic started in uh, about maybe 300 miles away from where I am now. And this was by the person called Bool. And it's from him that we have Boolean logic, which is the zero and one that is in your phone. So it's really, really powerful. And because Bool was here, uh, not very far from here, I think that was very inspiring also. So later, uh, like we were able to think about his ideas in mathematics and then bring it across into chemistry. So that was my journey to logic. Yes, sir. As a supramolecular chemist, what kind of research have you done and was able to advance the field? Can you elaborate on one? I certainly can. Again, like Randima, thanks for researching these questions because I certainly most of the 
the work I have done in recent years is thought to belong to supramolecular chemistry and I'm a very proud member of that community uh, because many people from those fields have inspired us very much. For example, again, this connects with University of Colombo. Uh, I was very happy to work in the University of Colombo with people like you at the time. And there was another De Silva like you and like me, uh, who I was very privileged to work with. He's called Salia De Silva. And I hope you will interview him in this way because he's a professor now in New Jersey in the US. And so he worked on his undergraduate project with me. So this is a little story I think I haven't told many people that because at that time we were beginning to realize that uh, supramolecular chemistry is a growing subject. So this was in 1985 or 1984, around there. And so then at that time, of course, as you know, uh, uh, you can imagine, at that time the library in uh, our University of Colombo did not have many of the journals, even though the librarian was very helpful, Mr. Sunil, but we didn't have the particular journals. So we were reading what we could, Salia and I, and then we found a name of a professor who was contributing a lot of very original ideas at the time. And his name was Professor Lane, L-E-H-N. And uh, we, Salia wrote to him because I told Salia we don't have many of these papers. It would be nice to get some material if we can. And so Salia wrote a air mail letter. I still remember clearly in my head. And he wrote this letter off to Professor Lane. He was in France, in North France, in Strasbourg. And then after about a month, if I remember correctly, there was this big envelope full of printed papers of his. And he sent it to Salia and said, good luck with your project. And that must have been 1985 or so. And then two years later, he was one of the winners of the Nobel Prize for supramolecular chemistry. So, so that was our introduction to supramolecular chemistry, really. And so he, con this Professor Lane continued to be a great inspiration to me, for sure. And so there have been several others. And then there is another person who won the Nobel Prize for the next part of supramolecular chemistry called Fraser Stoddart. And again, he has been a real big brother to me for a long time and has helped me to like develop little bits of chemistry myself. So you are quite right to say uh, maybe supramolecular chemistry is where I spend most of the time now. And I'm happy to do that because, like I mentioned to you earlier, I like to be in a mixture of subdisciplines. And supramolecular chemistry carries all the subdisciplines. So you must have some organic chemistry, you must have some inorganic analytical and physical, and if you like polymer chemistry and like that, pull in as many ideas as possible. Of course, then we may not know anything very deeply that is a price we pay. But otherwise, supramolecular chemistry is a very happy place to be. Because many of the ideas we need to work in supramolecular chemistry are uh, very like human behavior. Uh, and I think that is quite unusual in science, but uh, we are lucky to have that. So for example, I'm sure you've seen it because you've done the research very well. Like uh, some of the time I now spend trying to make molecules which do human level computation. Molecules which act like us, how we think or how we do things. And so you are very right. So pramolecular chemistry is a part where I like to uh, do extra work in as long as I can. Okay, Professor, your compounds have already been incorporated into sensor technology. How long do you think it will be before we see them as components of a molecular computer? That's a very hard question. But it's a question, again, that has been discussed at uh, major conferences uh, with uh, people who are of all ages. And so thank you for thinking in those directions because that way you will maybe able to get good answers to that later on, even if I cannot. But one of the ways I can 
give the answer to that is to say that first of all we were uh, like we were very lucky to develop the sensor technology because it is not something i uh, set out to do even though i dreamed about it but we, as you know dreams are dreams we wake up in the morning and it's gone and so i would have dreamt while at the university of colombo to think that our sensors can be used to measure things in plants and animals and as i mentioned to you earlier on the mother biologists were beginning to measure calcium at the time and so and some of those were pet sensors as well so i was very happy when they started at the time and so then there was this realization that a lot of biology can be understood by chemistry by measuring things inside because biology is molecular and atomic finally finally and so because of that uh, i i knew that some day people will want to measure it but i but i am not powerful in that way i can't walk into a company and tell them here you should do this they won't listen to me they will put their dogs on me so but i was very fortunate that when we do some science and when we publish that information then that information will be read by all kinds of people normally of course the only person who reads it used to be my mother nobody else reads our papers i thought but then as it turned out people in roch diagnostics had read it in, and they some of them were in germany and austria at the time the company itself is swiss but uh, nevertheless then those scientists came to belfast and then they said we like to develop this said and i was very very happy that they did and then because they are a very large multinational corporation which has branches all over the world they knew how to take it everywhere including colombo sri lanka so so i was very very grateful for the sensor technology part i think what it showed randima is that uh, sensor science can become technology very quickly if there is commercial and financial will there must be people in companies and people who control large sums of finance they have to realize that this is useful for society and that it's useful for them Uh, so i was lucky that roche diagnostics saw it that way and because they were a large multinational they had the will and the moment they decided the finances were there the commercial structures were there and so that's why they could supply sri lanka ambulance crews they could supply so uh, so i was very lucky in that but philosophically it was always possible if you make a good sensor for some Uh, atomic or molecular species randima some day somebody will then say that species is important in some illness so i was lucky with sodium just sodium huh? so like we do flame test and so rosh then needed a, like a flame test without a fire and so our fluorescent one became their choice and of course they had been thinking about it for some time but they did not have a workable molecular system and then we had our fluorescent pet system and they liked it and now it's everywhere so so why i mentioned that slowly to develop the story slowly for you randima is that sensor work that we do in science can become technology very quickly because people want to measure what is there because it will have a health effect in some way the, that's why as you see i have delayed answering the second part of your question as you say sensor technology we were fortunate but molecular computer where it is it so as i said this is discussed heavily in conferences and people get very emotional about this and the question can be answered at several levels first of all a molecular computer is something we don't have to make because it is already there and that uh, computer which is there is you randima disilva 
or AP De Silva or Neranga ABC. It can be us because this again is a point again we have discussed with computer scientists in large corporations, but they don't believe us. Uh, meaning that there is a belief among all of us that a technology is something you pay money for or something that can be bought and sold. Uh, I disagree. I, and again, I say this from the Pirivena and the Kovila and the Faldia experience, which is to say a technology, again, if you look in a dictionary, a technology is a useful science or a useful knowledge base. So if that is the definition of a technology, what is more useful than a person? A person, your parents are very proud of you and out there will be other people. Randima Di Silva fan club, they will all be very proud of you, isn't it? And like now I get the chance to see you and talk with you and then I will be impressed also. So that is a useful knowledge. So if we think in that way, then molecular computers are everywhere. Any living thing a plant or an insect or people or, and parts of us. And I think this is a knowledge that came to biology in the 1980s. And I was very lucky in time again to be at the University of Colombo because I could read biology journals in the science library. Whereas in many big universities, I'll be frightened to go to the biology library. Here we had lovely people who were good friends of ours and the science library had all the journals together. So you just pick up a journal. I most likely won't understand most of it. And then suddenly I understand something, which was this model that calcium signaling was starting there. And then I could see, ah, uh -huh, now here it is information from within the molecule, from the molecules and atoms are inside the cells and people are beginning to measure it. So that again was a big understanding at the time, uh, which was developing in biology. And I was very glad to see it, this molecular physiology. And so I slowly understood a little more. And now it's wonderful, even now, now, like when we are talking this year, now there is synthetic biology, which is a big, big field. And there are lots of them who use molecular logic now. So I'm very happy because now they know if they want to create life in some way or modify life in some way. And by they, I mean the biologists, the real professional biologists. And then they need to put into their molecular and cell systems a way of computing because they, the system has to live. And to live, the living system has to take information from outside and measure that and process that in order to survive and prosper. So now molecular logic is everywhere, uh, but it always was everywhere. I think that is the main point Randima I'm trying to, I suppose, make is that molecular computers, therefore, I am repeating now, maybe don't have to be made. They are already there and they function at an extremely sophisticated level, meaning humans or life of any kind, a bacterium, living by itself is very sophisticated because it's surviving and it's doing things. So because of that, molecular computers don't have to be made. I think this was a big realization and we tried to write a bit about it over the years. But again, there was this big demand that we should have a computer like what we are using now to do our discussion, uh, which is fine. But then fairly quickly, people realize the limitation. Now that limitation is being acknowledged more and more, which is that when we do molecular logic, we are not following semiconductor logic exactly. We are taking some strong points and then we are using our own strong points and avoiding our weak points. So, for example, one of the big weak points of molecular logic which exists now, and in fact, it was understood when we published on it first, IBM, IBM, the big corporation challenged us and, and they were quite right to challenge us. They said, uh, uh, what we are doing is rubbish. Uh, their words were stronger because they said, uh, 
because our first system, Randi Manchu, as you know, we were using a sodium input or proton input and getting fluorescence output. Like if we want to process information, then you must have an input and an output separately. So we use sodium input and light output. And IBM, they are very powerful scientists uh, from their limits of computation branch. They were the ones who challenged us and they were quite right. They said, this will never work. Yeah, sodium is coming in, light is coming out. Then how do you do the next one? The next one is sodium coming in. So how do you from light go to sodium? You can do that, but it's more complicated. So they were quite right. And I'm very grateful to those IBM scientists because then they taught me like almost personally from their personal writings, why they said we are rubbish. They said modern computers succeed because they use voltage input, five volts at the time, and the output is also five volts. So then you can take that output and put it into the next one and the next one. And that is how we are able to communicate. Now. So um, modern computation relies on serial integration. You can have one logic gate joined to the next one, next one, next one. Uh, molecular logic gate is still terrible. We can only do even the best ones from the synthetic biologists now, which appear in the biggest journals now. It's really amazing. It's coming out from MIT and Caltech and the big universities of the world. Is usually about maybe the serial integration, maybe five or six gates. That is all. Whereas your phone will easily do a thousand. So these are some of the differences. So then that was what IBM meant when they told me molecular logic is rubbish. But what they forgot, and this was the amazing thing to me, and I'm very happy to discuss this with you. What they forgot is that they themselves are molecular computers. So within their own mind and within their own body, things are happening with ions. And, and in fact, your eye works with light input and ion output. When we see each other now, light goes in the front and from the back of your eye, calcium ions go and sodium and potassium go. So it's the opposite of our first molecular logic gate. And those big engineers, they refused to believe it. So I think their point was they had a technology which was commercially successful. Anything else, if it is to be successful, it must work according to the same model, which I believe respectfully was a mistake. Uh, it's not like that. There can be more than one model to achieve any result. And that is something I learned through religion. That's why there are lots of religions, for example. So that's why there is diversity in the world. And now this was completely forgotten. They said, no, no, you must not have diversity. You must have voltage, voltage, voltage. And of course, with voltage alone, you can succeed. And you can succeed with the diversity also. And that success is you and I. And they were not prepared, the big engineers were not prepared to admit that. So now I am glad the world of science is slowly shifting and people are recognizing, especially when synthetic biology becomes stronger because it's much more fashionable. And then there will be a large atomic and molecular component going into that. So chemistry will become stronger as a result. So in summary, the answer to your very thoughtful question would be sensor technology is easy to make a technology from because it is only gathering information only gathering information gathering is straightforward processing is can be straightforward but it can also be extremely complicated because processing means again it's really nice the dictionary meaning of process is stepwise events. You must have lots of events. You must have one step. No, two steps at least. You must join one to another, one to another. That is the meaning of processing. So processing is naturally complicated. 
it can be one step or it can be a, a million steps like in your phone. So that is why uh, a molecular sensor can become a technology very quickly. A molecular computer can become a very successful technology, but it took millions of years for humans to become what they were. But if you also wanted small scale examples of processing for commercial purposes, that is very feasible. That is very possible. Though at the moment, there aren't any cases, I must say. And I must confess, uh, when Roche, like they have a fine with the sensor systems and when I offered them some of the computing ones, what they said is, we are already commercially successful with the sensor. So we don't want to disturb that at all. So the commercial will was not there, at least regarding Roche at the time. So your question is a very valuable one. And I hope you will discuss it with your friends, chemists and computer scientists and so on. And other people who are not scientists at all, whether they believe that a human being is a computer or whether a small insect is a computer. So these are questions which deserve brightest of minds and you will be one. Uh, how does computational chemistry help your research? Yeah, that is a very valuable point again. Uh, again, as you know, like computational chemistry was also given a Nobel Prize a few years ago, maybe 10 years now. Uh, again, that was for using computation methods. So it's mainly coming from mathematics and hard computer science and engineering and how we use it in chemistry. So whenever we use Gaussian, for example, so one of the inventors of Gaussian was John Popel. And so he was one of the Nobel Prize winners at the time. Um, and so like that, it is true. Those are the methods of quantum theory, which have benefited chemistry greatly, our understanding of small things. And then, of course, quantum theory became so predictive, it could make predictions for us. And then when the methods became simpler, like when density functional methods became available again with Professor Cohen. And so then those methods were combined. And now, of course, computational chemistry is used very widely. And I'm really glad even in our small things like this fluorescent PET systems. Now, many labs, we only do a couple, but many labs will use like Gaussian, which is available in many physical chemistry undergraduate labs now. So they will use it to determine whether the molecules are suitable for building a sensor from. If I may mention, Randima, like the fluorescent PET sensor design is one of the few engineering principles in chemistry. So in chemistry, we have lots of principles, very valuable things, but some of those are not, they are not engineering design. Like you kindly mentioned the Boyle Higgins uh, award a while ago. So as you know, Boyle's law, for example, we will have P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Like Now that is a principle. However, and Boyle was in Ireland also, and Robert Boyle. And so those are principles, but they are not engineering. Uh, engineering designs, as you know, are like an architect will draw a house and they will give dimensions and then you take it to a civil engineer and the civil engineer will make the house. So engineering designs are where somebody is able to design quantitatively. So because of that, now you could say computational chemistry is an engineering design for molecules because you can go in there and you can draw a molecule and get very accurate information of, of which is of a quantitative kind. Uh, fluorescent PT sensors is like that. So we were able to starting at the University of Colombo, and we were glad to understand it at the time by knowing electrode potentials or photochemistry properties. Then you can predict whether a molecule will be a sensor or not for a given target. And that's why Roche liked it. They liked it because it was predictive. They said, yeah, we, we don't want to put commercial resources in unless you can predict. So luckily we could. And so because of that, it is very true that computational chemistry will help in these engineering designs as time goes on. 
And so because of that, I think in the hands of young stars like you, because you will learn more computation from a younger age. So I only learned it when I was 30 years old, so too old. So whereas you will already know it. And so because of that, computational chemistry will help all of us. And I'm glad that it helped me also. And it's nice to mention, and I'm sure you asked the question with this understanding, computational chemistry and chemical computation are the opposites of each other. So molecular logic is molecular computation or chemical computation. And computational chemistry is the other side. So together, they make the whole of the connection between molecules and computer science, I think. What are the challenges you faced when doing research and how did you overcome them successfully? Uh, some of the time I don't overcome them successfully. Uh, sometimes I fail and fail and fail. And, uh, and of course, in research, we fail at many levels in many places. And uh, so one of the reasons we do science, I suppose, is because we like problems. But then problems by their nature are difficult. Uh, so there may be a lot of failures. Uh, but... But then there are successors too, and I'm very grateful for those. And uh, certainly, like, uh, one of the ways in which we overcame some of the problems was with helpful people. And those helpful people, for me, started off in the University of Colombo. And, uh, and, and again, like, as I mentioned earlier, like, some of the helpful people who taught me to think, like those people in the Pirivinners and, and the people then in the university, for sure, like, as I mentioned, a couple of those names of the technical people. And then, as I said, Professor Ramakrishna was a great help. And there was another person called Dr. Vincent Arkley. He came from England and then he's the one who allowed me and many of my friends to go overseas for PhDs. And so helpful people was one way in which we overcome problems. The other way, of course, is you overcome problems by selecting your problem. So there are lots of problems. Some problems have real headaches. They are big ones. So if you're very brave, and then you can tackle those. But other ways to tackle problems that seem soluble. And I was very grateful that one of the ways in which, like I was brought up, and again, I go back to those Parmanka de time, is... Uh, regard everything as a pleasure. It's learning, so it's okay. And if you can't solve one problem, you walk away and go to the next one and come back later. And so because of that, I think being interested in learning maybe was the biggest way in which I overcame problems, just being interested. And if we are happy to learn, then you keep accumulating knowledge, bits, bits and bits. And then, like again, I would give you that example from Satish Namasivayan. And then he taught me the logic gates. And now I can have a picture in my head of real logic gates because I've held them in my hands and tried to connect them together. And Satish would tell me, no, no, that's the wrong way. And then I slowly learn. And then once you have the picture, then I can go away and connect it to other things. So the I think the biggest way of overcoming problems, I think, is to learn from as many people as possible and from many sources of information as possible. But otherwise, we have to be prepared for failure, I think. Okay. Professor, speaking about your other interest, I got to know that you were interested in music. So how did you become interested in music? Uh, again, I think it's a Sri Lankan thing. Because as you know, in Sri Lanka, many of us drum. We drum on tables, chairs, people, we hit, hit things. Um, so I'm a drummer mainly. And uh, though I'm not a trained drummer, like I thought about it in Sri Lanka at one stage that it would be nice to go to a, like a Lalita Kala and learn that kind of thing. But uh, it never happened. But I was very glad I could just start off on a table and a chair and play. And then just by listening to the radio, just radio, radio, and then you learn and then you copy. And then again, I'm very grateful to the University of Colombo because as you know, in the university, there are always chances to 
meet fellow musicians or real musicians. I'm not a real musician, but I try. And then we, I was lucky to play in a band for some time. And then from that, I was able to come here. And in Belfast, again, it was a great help. And so I played here for a long time with the band, long time. Uh, and I'm very grateful that they accepted me and we play. And so I think that has been a real pleasure also because uh, science, if we do science alone, sometimes the head is in a bad place. So I find it's really lovely to play music in the night and then the next day your head is clean. And then when you start science again, you see it in a new way. And so I find mixing science and music has been a great privilege for me. And I'm very grateful for the people who have accepted me musically, even though I'm not a trained musician. How can we ensure that chemistry remains at the top of the scientific way? Uh, again, a tough question. Uh, I, I think chemistry has always been, in my understanding, at the top of the scientific tree, but it's not acknowledged by various people. It's not acknowledged by the media for various reasons. And I think the reason is chemistry, is, when it works best, it is invisible because we are dealing with atoms and molecules and atoms and molecules are so much smaller than us. But as I tried to discuss in the previous questions you asked, the very perceptive questions you asked, the success of chemistry is because of that, because it's invisible. And then you have to be philosophical or nearly religious because religion was old thinking done by people for thousands of years. And so when you can't see things, you have to think and therefore, a lot of thinking is required in chemistry. And that is why now that we recognize that the world, everything, everything uh, inside of us, especially, but outside of us also is built out of atoms and many cases are molecules. And so then chemistry will always be there. So whatever you put at the top of the scientific tree. So let's say we take, for example, that biology gets very good media attention. And so, say, when they talk about biology, there'll be a piece of DNA somewhere. There will be an enzyme somewhere. There will be a receptor protein somewhere. And these are molecules. So that's chemistry. So in that sense, I think chemistry is always at the top of the scientific tree. Even if you go to physics, which again has very good publicity machinery, chemistry has always failed. We can discuss, discuss why in a second. But then again, when they discuss about astronomy and they discuss about stars and then there are atoms to be discussed and those atoms will give out light and then we measure the light spectroscopically. So physics and chemistry can claim that equally. So, so the first answer to, my, to your question, Randima, is that chemistry or chemistry ideas have always been in the scientific tree close to the top. What is taken as the top of the tree depends on the popularity of the fashion at the time. And it depends on how well we combine with journalists and media. Uh, this has been discussed by much cleverer people than me. Uh, chemists have always been bad to deal with the media. So, in fact, what we are doing now, and I think we have to congratulate Neranga for doing this, this is to address that problem. Every time we do something like this, when we discuss something and we make it available to others, if they want to know, then this becomes the media. So one of the problems chemistry has had for a long time is one is the invisibility and the other is the fact that chemistry is so relevant to people. Because as we saw, we are atomic molecular. So anything we do has a chemical consequence and has a chemical origin. So we are all tangled. And so because of that, it's very easy when a mistake happens, for instance, for people to say, ah, that's chemistry. And the other important point to note is because chemistry is so connected with us, chemistry is always commercial. So like there are many chemical companies, like there are very few physics companies. Okay, now there are biotechnology companies. There are companies who do other engineering things which use physics ideas. And now the semiconductor world, you could say started off with physics. But chemistry, there are real companies called chemistry companies. 
And then the problem becomes when companies want profit above everything else, that's what companies do, I suppose, then the people who run the companies might decide to use chemistry in ways which are harmful. And so like pollution was a big issue for many years. And that's because the chemical companies made a product which they could sell. And then that product happened to cause problems in people in different ways. And that was not acknowledged. Why? The company says, no, we are making a profit. So chemistry gets blamed for that. So, and see, it all comes around to the fact that chemistry is so, so human. We are, it's so tied up with humanity. It's because chemistry is so tied up with life. And so, see, we call that biology, but chemistry is so heavily tied into it. So that's why, as I mentioned earlier, biology has a very strong chemical foundation, which is clear now and was clear since the 1980s. And so this is the reason why chemistry gets bad press, bad press. Um, so in that way, like physics will almost never get bad press because there aren't large companies which will say they are physics companies. But companies, because they are making a profit and capitalism unfortunately works like that, companies are not always responsible. And so then chemistry gets blamed. So I think therefore chemistry will always be at the top of the scientific tree if we engage with journalists. If we engage with the media, so then it also means in the media, we need to have good chemists. And in fact, uh, like there are very many examples now. There are good chemists who do PhDs and they develop highly and then they become journalists. So we need more of that. And if that happens, then the top of the scientific tree will be available. And also the other point, just to complete that, we need more chemists who are good, recognized politicians. Politicians. And we have very little of that. But there is a wonderful, wonderful example. Angela Merkel, the German chancellor. Now, she's a chemistry PhD, huh? and a very thoughtful person. And who, no, sorry, we are discussing politics. But it is, again, to say something gets to the top of a tree, usually because of political and media influences. And by poli politics, I mean the good version of politics, where which is looking after populations. And so like this lady I mentioned, like she's an example of that, I think. So there can be more of that in the future. And then I think chemistry will be ensured a more visible place. So I think the summary answer is chemistry was always there because of its very nature, because it's at the very nature of matter and living matter, especially. And then if we want to make sure it gets there, we must be able to make sure the message of chemistry goes to the general public. And that goes through the media and it goes through the politicians. Finally, I would like to ask what advice you have for an aspiring young chemist. Uh, I am not good at adv advice because I think I have always believed that people have to discover their own roots. But at the same time, it, we can share the journey in which each person goes. And so I happen to do the journey a little before you. That's why I'm older. But And so then I suppose there will be some ideas. And the first thing is, if you are aspiring, that is the first success. If you have the aspiration then you're halfway there. If a person does not have the aspiration, then they won't get there at all. And so the next thing is that you are studying the subject now. And just like I studied it some time ago in the same university. So when we study the subject and if we take a general interest, general, I think that's a big word for me, general. And to be generally interested, in the chemistry and in the other things that are close to it. Because you never know the combinations you will make with the chemistry you are learning in the classroom, for example, and something you see on the street, on the road. And then by making the combination, you might solve a problem later on. So I think for, and I think I am still an aspiring chemist also. I'm still trying to meet aspirations because I, I'm lucky I've been able to 
solve some problems, but there will be others which deserve solutions. And so the thing I will therefore try to do for myself also is to keep learning of all kinds and from all kinds of people. And then we will all be better people tomorrow. Before we wind up, is there anything else would you like to say, Professor Epi? I think I'm happy enough. You have been a lovely interviewer, so I think I'm very happy. Maybe if I were to ask, do you play music also besides chemistry? Uh, not actually. Okay, that's a secret then. <laughs> oh, I suppose I don't have anything else to say except to say I would wish very well for the program that you are doing and for the subject that you are studying. And again, I would congratulate you and Neeranga for doing this kind of activity because I think the University of Colombo can continue to produce things which are worthwhile to the whole world. And again, maybe in that, co that context, I think we should not forget that uh, Sri Lanka has uh, several things which I think the world has maybe not noticed enough. And I think I can mention two of them. I think one of them is the word, one word, serendipity, which we use in science and we use outside of science when accidentally happy things happen to one person or another. And so that word is Sri Lankan. I mentioned this to a couple of Nobel Prize winners and they were really surprised that the word comes from Sri Lanka. And the other one, which maybe deserves a mention now, like especially with like the US elections completed and so on, like, like now there's a lot of celebration about Kamala Harris, that she's the first lady from Asian and ethnic start that to be in a high position of power. But very few people know that it is Sri Lanka who gave the first woman prime minister to the world. Though I've been amazed at the number of people who know the name Sirimao Bandarai. But now those are things, I mentioned those to say that Sri Lanka has contributed things to the world, even though we are 22 million population and a small geographic space. And so like giving a word, which is such a word of hope or showing that like in Sirimao Madam's time, like that kind of example that a lady can run a country. So in that same way, then there's no reason many wonderful chemistry things can't come from Sri Lanka and the University of Colombo in particular. So thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you so much, Professor A.P. De Silva for giving us your valuable time. It is an honor to have this inspiring discussion with you.